Tech News Weekly is sponsored by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All streaming directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash gfq. Starting Tech News Weekly in 3, 2, 1... Hey everybody, welcome to Tech News Weekly, your source for all things technology and everything that happened in the week. I'm Andrew Zarian. Of course, I'm joined by uh, Mr. John Bubb, uh, also known as Suncast. He is the producer here at the GFK Network. He is the editor here at the GFK Network. He is also a lover, a father, a mother, and a daughter. How you doing, John? (laughs) If only all those things were maybe true, I might have my life together. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh boy um i'm still getting the hang of this uh system that we have here so we've done a lot of changes to the way that we do our video stuff here and now the numeric pad the buttons are all whacked out so camera six is what camera nine was so we gotta get used to it but a lot to talk about today we've been off for a couple of weeks you know in the summer we take a lighter schedule here but uh i want to get right into some stuff you know microsoft big week for microsoft actually i should say it's been a big couple months for microsoft because they have had uh, announcement after a disaster, after press release, after firing, <laughs> after replacement, after another. I mean, it's been a crazy couple months for Microsoft. And, you know, I, I normally, especially with Paul on, on What the Tech, we, I try not to talk a lot about Microsoft. We try to talk about other things. But holy cow, right. there's a lot happening with Microsoft. Yeah. I mean, Windows Phone 8.1, Windows 8.1, uh, the restructuring, which we're going to talk about. The Xbox, the awful press release they put out, uh, all the all the always on things stuff that happened. So a lot is happening. Yesterday there was an event here in New York. A lot of Microsoft people were here. They also did their restructuring announcement yesterday. Uh, coincidentally, at, you know, around the same time. So why don't we first go into the restructuring of Microsoft okay. and what that means for the company? Uh, John, go into the story quickly. All right, so this is something that's been rumored for a while now, and I know that Paul's talked about this on What the Tech, is that Microsoft has decided that they're going to reorganize or restructure the way that they they have their departments. Basically, what they're going to end up having, I believe, if I understand this correctly, and I'm not sure I even understand the, the, the entirety of this, is that they're going to have a services division and a devices of it, division. That's what they're going to be focusing on. So what ends up happening is that they're going to restructure um, – each of these departments where someone's going to head up one of these departments and then they're going to shift around the employees. And so what this means is that people that were in charge of certain projects are no longer in charge of those projects and they have a different person in charge of those projects now. So my question is going to be whether or not this is something that's good for Microsoft or bad for Microsoft. Uh, I, I think it's a good thing. I mean, they, they, they're they obviously doing it as a way to kind of consolidate the divisions and kind of bring everybody together. But uh, what do you think of their online division? I mean, there was some story. Did you read the stories about their online division kind of falling apart and, and I have losing not. money? So the online no. division has been losing a lot of money because it's Bing. And Bing's not – it's costing them a lot. But with this re, the way that the re, restructuring is going, uh, Bing – is now with all their cloud-based services, which is making a lot of money, like Azure, which uh, you know is NT-based. So Azure is going to be under cloud and uh, online. You're also going to have Live 365. Mm-hmm. Uh, not Live, th- uh, no 360. Live, yeah, Live 365. No, Office 365. Live 365 Office. is something totally different. Uh, Office 365 is going to fall under that umbrella. So it's going to show that they're making some money, right? So I think it's a, it's it's a decent uh, idea, and you know, less divisions, more more uh, transparency in between each department. Here's what I'm hoping out of all of this is that I think, in my opinion, from from my time using Windows 8, I'm not a big fan of anything that they've done in the last year with Windows 8. I just think that it's been a complete disaster from my point of view. So yeah. I'm hoping that this reorganization or restructuring fixes those problems that led to Windows 8.1. I, I understand that they had a whole vision for Windows 8.1, but 
I don't think that they were able to fully realize that vision the way that it should be done. It, there's just so many problems, in my opinion, with Windows 8 now that they, they launched a half-baked product that they're now having to slowly fix. Like, I, I don't understand why they didn't put 8.1 out six months after Windows 8 came out to kind of fix some of the stuff that people did not like about it. So now it's it's basically going to be almost a year later before the first fixes come for Windows 8. Yeah, but do you think they, they could have done all the changes for um, version, you know, the uh, six months from now? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You think they I, could I really do. I mean, I, I mean, six months into they're it. Doing, it's just small stuff. A lot of what I see is small stuff. I, I don't see anything major. It's, it's stuff they could have been included when they launched a freaking thing. Yeah, I... It, I'm going to give it the benefit benefit of the doubt. And by the way, if you're watching live, I had to restart the stream. So no worries. Uh, it should be back within a couple seconds. But uh, the the issue that I had with Windows 8 was not necessarily the same stuff that you had. I wanted to be able to boot into desktop. I don't want to boot into Metro. Yeah. So I, like, why the, there, there was no reason for them not to be able to include an option well, right off the bat for that, or even six months down the road. I mean, my theory is that that was a Sanofsky thing. Uh, he really was not, he, it was his way or the highway. And him doing this, you know, him adding this, the, the desktop kind of was catering and it was kind of going to be like, okay, well, I'm bending for you guys. And he didn't want to bend. But I think when you're talking about enterprise, they don't want Metro, they want desktop. No, no. And the fact is that Metro just is not built up and developed enough for enterprise it, it's still very much a beta product i think when when you ask people that are in an enterprise world it, it's just something that they're not willing to take the chance on using right now it's just not there yet for them yeah um 8.1 what do you think how do you think people are going to perceive 8.1 and i'll get into the 8.1 story that we have right now but do you think it's going to be wow well, this is a lot better yeah, I think I think some people are going to be in that boat. It's still going to be somewhat of a mixed bag. I'm hoping. I, I do. I actually have hope for Windows 8.1, believe it or not. E even though I'm not a big fan of Windows 8, I am hoping that Windows 8.1 will kind of smooth out a lot of the wrinkles that we have now. I'm not sure it's going to do all that, but I do have a lot of hope that it will end up being better than what I think it might end up being ultimately. And what is that? <laughs> it's just more disaster. Yeah, I, but, but what it's it is, new, there's, there's a, a lot of things system. that they've done. I, I mean, but, but well, let's it give is, it the benefit but, of the doubt. It, it's a brand new system. It's a new way of looking at things that they've totally changing the ball, uh, the the roadmap of what Windows have has been for the last you know 25 years, 30 years, whatever. Um, they have taken a different approach to computing on a desktop, and they're not going to get it right on this. What one. really, really drives me crazy and it's something that i've never seen anybody really explain or talk about or say that microsoft did this can i guess my, can i guess my, no because you're never gonna okay. guess this okay go ahead um i've been helping my mom pick out a new laptop she's gone through several different laptops at this point like four or five of them trying to figure out one that she likes and one of the things that i've noticed on that is the fact that the function keys no longer work necessarily as function keys at least not the way that we're used to. So normally, if I want to refresh a page, it's F5. I just press the F5 key, right? Sure. Well, now they have media keys on these these function keys, which we've, we've kind of seen before, but that only worked in, like, media applications. Now that works with everything. So if you're in a page on a website and you want to refresh it, you have to actually do function, hold down the function key, and then F5, in order to refresh the page. Or if you wanted to close a page or an application, normally it's Alt F4. Now it's Alt Function F4. Otherwise, you activate the media keys, and it's just very weird. It's like I haven't seen anybody mention this before, and I'm like, what the heck? This is just very bizarre. I mean, I can kind of understand it, but at the same time, it's like, why don't I have a choice for this? Well, I, th I think this, it's the same thing. A lot of people aren't using any of these functions, you know, in Windows. Most people are not. They have no interest in a function key or even F5. But I, it, it's a keyboard shortcut that for people like us that do keyboard shortcuts all day long, this is something that really helps us. But now, oh, wait, I have to completely relearn the way I do these, do these shortcuts and actually add a set, another key 
to do these keyboard combinations. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I remember hearing about those complaints early on that people have to relearn shortcuts. And it's, it's little things here and there that, you know, yes, they changed some of the shortcuts, but uh, like now it's normally the Windows key and another key. But the fact that it's not the same key as the previous combination, which is kind of weird. Yeah, I don't know. I, don't, I You know, there's so much changing over there. Um, and I talked about this uh, with Rich last night during his show on My Take Radio. Oh, you were on a uh, show. I, I wasn't on a show, but I was in the chat room chiming in on some stuff. And, and one of the things that we all agree on is, is the fact that managing wireless networks in Windows 8 really, really, really sucks. Okay, why? So I've been helping my – well, here's the thing is that – you know how you could like view manage, view and manage wireless networks in Windows 7? Okay. You can't do that in Windows 8. There is no view and manage – wireless networks hmm. there just isn't in order to as far as i understand the only way to really set up a manual network uh, or add a manual network name is to actually set up a new connection which is just completely different than the way that windows 7 does it oh, that's so frustrating and, it, and it's not something that's intuitive either there's so much stuff i believe in my opinion, in Windows 8, that just is not intuitive. Yeah, I, I, and that's really what it comes but down is to. It, is, is it is, not intuitive for you as a power user, or, or is it not intuitive for anybody? I mean, I, I'm I'm I have yet to hear from someone that is an average user that is saying, "Well, no, this is great. I absolutely love it." I think part of it is just the way it operates on a desktop type of system, a, a, a laptop even. Where you have a a keyboard and a mouse and a screen and not necessarily a touch screen. Yeah, I, I think a lot of what they did makes much more sense if it's just a tablet or a smartphone. I mean, but I not so it, much for a traditional PC. I used it a couple of weeks ago on a higher end like Sony Vio. Uh, one of my my wife's cousin has, and I was using a touch screen on that. I'm like, wow, this is pretty good. It's pretty responsive. It works well on a touch screen, but I also don't want to be touching my screen. <laughs> that's you though i mean i i don't want to touch my screen i don't why i don't understand why anybody would want to <laughs> but that's the way that windows 8 works now so you kind of almost have to yeah uh 8.1 i don't know if you mentioned it. they're going to be shipping it to oems in august so we're getting really close to a september release uh rtm will be coming out around then uh, uh, you know what's next? Like I, I'm, I, I, I think some of these changes are great, but what are they going to do next? I almost I wish they would do what Paul has been saying all along that they need to do is just continually release updates whenever they feel like they have something ready to go. Yeah, yeah. I, I wish they would do that because Windows 8 is such a pain in the butt to use, in my opinion, right now. Yes, you can kind of get used to it. It's a lot of getting used to and adjusting the way you do things. But the fact is that I still think that there's a lot more they need to do with Windows 8 and having to wait a year for these updates, it's just kind of ridiculous to me. Yeah. I mean, this is stuff that I think would help them if they could get them out sooner. Talk about, since we're talking about disasters, why don't we talk about BlackBerry for a couple seconds? Because <laughs> uh, they're another company that has no idea how to talk to their customers. Uh. BlackBerry confirms that at least one BlackBerry 7 base will be shipping this year. The Bold 9720. So they went through all of this stuff, right? How they're, the new BlackBerry is going to change everything. And this is the future of BlackBerry. And they're cutting back on all these phones. And they're going to release these phones. Uh, you know, two phones. One touchscreen. One, one with a keyboard. Uh, that's it. And... Now they're back to where oh, they yeah. were. We, we're also going to have a BlackBerry 7 device that we're releasing. Why? Why would they do that? I have no freaking clue. I, I at, at this point, it's just like, I, I don't understand this company anymore. I don't and, and part of it, too, is I think, in a way, there's just nothing they can do. <sighs> and I'm almost, in a way, putting Windows Phone 8 in the same boat where, uh, for whatever reason, neither one of these companies, neither one of these devices can really get any sort of traction. And it's not like it's not impossible to get traction, but the fact is that they're not really able to make any traction whatsoever. Black, uh, Heinz stated that BlackBerry won't have more than six devices on sale at any given time. That's You know what that is? That's four devices too many. 
Yeah. I mean, they should honestly have two phones. The Q10 well, they're also and coming the Z10. out with this A10 and um, some other couple different devices, and it's just like, really, you've done such a good job so far. It's such a good. And he phone, even admitted too. the other day that, and I think you cover this somewhere. Um, they were saying that Thorsten Hein, the, the uh, CEO of BlackBerry, was saying that, yeah, we kind of botched the launch of uh, BlackBerry Ten in the U.S. In the U.S., he said, yeah. I, I mean. Was- See, was, and that, that's very interesting. Why was that? Why did they botch that? Yeah, I mean, that's a good well, question to wrong. ask. Why, why did they botch it? Why do you think they botched it? I don't necessarily think they botched it. I just don't think they did as well as they were hoping to. I don't think anything was really wrong with the way that they released it. Yeah. I mean, what do you think? I mean, they certainly had set had advertising out there. I just don't think that they made... They might not, made, may, might not have made a big enough push. I think. Also, releasing it uh, in different countries at different times takes a lot of the. That was that was very bad. And yeah, I think that's what they mean by botch is the fact that you could get this pretty much everywhere except here in the United States. You could get it in Canada. You could get it in Germany. You could have get got it in London, like a whole month before you could get it here in the United States. But you know what they should do, and and th- this is something that the, I don't understand why these companies do like. Microsoft, they'll do this, and they'll say uh, big unveiling. They'll do this big giant unveiling for whatever the product is, and they'll be they'll say, well, yeah, it's shipping somewhere in the fall, like six months, seven months before this device is coming out. They're announcing it. That doesn't work. Can you imagine if no. Apple did that? They had the iPad announcement, and like, yeah, this is the next iPad. This is what we're gonna have, but it's gonna be ready in four months. And, and I think in a way that kind of sets everybody up for disappointment. You know, they kind of did that. They kind of did do that. Yeah. You're, you're setting them up for we're going to have all these great things. But but in the time that there, you wait seven months, technology is going to change so much that what they're telling you about is no longer relevant. I, I think they made a big mistake with that um, with the Mac Pro. They should not have announced that Mac Pro now. They should have waited to announce that Mac Pro when they were closer to a time of release. Because yeah. if you look at it, a lot of people looked at this thing like, wow, this thing is cool. I want to get it. When can I pre-order? When is it out? And then you find out, well, it's coming out in the fall. By the time the fall comes, you may have either already spent that money, no longer that's have that money, or no longer interested. So it, it, it's still a device that's going to be, I think, with the technology that they do have packed inside that is still going to be, because you're, you're talking about desktop. Desktop actually moves much slower pace than mobile phones do. Yeah, okay, sure. No, you're right. So, I mean, let's go back to the mobile then. Uh, you know, yesterday was a Nokia event here in New York. Uh, Nokia announced the Lumia 1020, which I did have a chance to play with. Oh, cool. What did you think uh, of it? it? It's a fascinating device. Uh, it's nearly identical to the 920, just one gig more of RAM. It's a little bit lighter than the 920, which I was surprised at, considering the big bulge in the back. But it's not a pretty phone. I'll tell you that. It is not a good-looking phone because the back actually literally there's a bulge coming out for the camera. But holy cow, that camera, it takes some nice pictures. Hmm. Really nice pictures. And they have this back of this battery adapter which connects to it. It's this plastic casing. Actually, I could... Oh, it's going to work. Never mind. Um, what happens, you connect it. <laughs> And it's able to kind of give you more battery life, but it becomes more of a camera than a phone, which was pretty cool. Listen, it's a very niche device. Are the, is the mainstream going to go and buy this? No, I don't think so. I think some people are going to buy it. Uh, I think they just wanted to bring this pure view technology to the States, and this is what they did. Yeah. But it, it's a cool concept. The camera is really good, but you're not going to see a lot of people walking around with this phone. No, but, you know, think about this. That's a Windows phone. There's just not a lot of people walking around with Windows phone compared to Android or iPhone. There just isn't. it. And this is why I say that I think they're, in a way, in the same boat as BlackBerry, where they're just they're making the same mistakes almost step in step, where, for whatever reason, these are two companies that don't understand the U.S. market whatsoever. And, and, and so they're not able to make any kind of traction, which is, I, I, I don't really understand why. I don't understand why, if it's just the operating system, do people not like the operating system? Is it because people don't know about it? What, with Windows Phone? Or, 
Yeah, Windows Phone. Um, I just don't think that they have. Uh, I think is there the market- not enough people out there talking about it. Not enough word of mouth. No, you know what it is the, the the market is so saturated right now with iOS and Android, where really whoever comes in at this point is not is not going to be you know one of the top names. There's a big. But why can't something come along in and become a top name? Android did it. Market saturation. You, you had BlackBerry and you had iPhone, and Android came along came along and completely knocked down BlackBerry and and matched iPhone. Yeah, I, I, but did they did they really match iPhone? Think about that. I think they did. Uh, not not when they launched, but not, at this point, they are definitely neck and neck with iPhone. Yeah, but I mean, but compare the top three Android flagship phones compared to everything else that's on the market. I think Android's approach has been let's saturate the market with fifty phones from fifty different carriers every couple months. Let's just get it out there so we take the market share and people say, well, look, you're beating iPhone. Windows is not taking that approach. Windows is pretty much just, just shrinking when it comes to their OEMs, and they're, they're pretty much Nokia is the flagship. So they really have one major Windows phone. That's why the, it's I, really I, impossible to I, take market I think market a lot of it comes, comes down to the carrier themselves as well, just not wanting to care about oh, Windows yeah. phone. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. The, uh, Verizon and AT&T, they, they've... They're not a priority for them. I and, like and, Windows Phone a lot. I think that's the funny thing. Like, I went into a Verizon store the other day, and honestly, I had a really hard time finding Android and Windows Phone. What was it all about the iPhone? Yeah. It really was. I, I, I couldn't. And you know what? Even out in the front, they had a, uh, a Samsung Android camera out in the front. But if you wanted, like, a Samsung Galaxy phone, no, that's in the back. And, and they really only had, I think, at most two Windows phones. Yeah, you know what? You are, I th- you are right. It, it is the carrier, really. That kind of depicts how they're going to. And Android, Android became successful because iPhone iOS was not on every carrier. Yeah, it was on AT and T for the longest time, so you really didn't have a choice. If you're on Verizon, guess what? You're buying an Android phone. That's a that's a very good point too. That, I mean, that and, that and played a major part. Now the iPhone is on every single carrier. It, I just, I feel sympathetic for BlackBerry and Windows Phone that they're not able to make any traction because, in a way, I feel like, in order for them to improve, they need to have some sort of traction. But also, but if they don't have any people, traction, they're just not going to care. They're but, just going to give up. But here's the other thing: once you're in the ecosystem, you're not going to switch. The odds of you switching are going to be pretty slim once you're invested into the ecosystem. True. A lot of people are invested in iOS. I do not think they're going to jump ship and go. And I'm talking about the average user. Forget about our viewer base. Forget about what we do. You're not going to see moms and dads going after having an iPhone for three years, going and buying an Android phone. I mean, there there, there will be those people out there that do that. But Very slim. In large part, I don't think so. Very slim. You're more likely to see a see a shift from Android to iPhone iOS, but you're not going to see it from iOS to um. Uh, iOS to Android. Yeah. Well, and you're talking about two different types of people. The people that like Android w- is, would be okay, I think, with iPhone. I think the people that are happy with an iPhone may not necessarily be happy with an Android. So, actually, your your parents just went from Android to iOS. Yeah. How are they doing with it? I'm not entirely sure. I think my dad is cool with it. My mom is having a little bit more of an issue with it, just getting it set up. But then again, she's also trying to get it all worked out with iTunes, which makes it a completely different beast. What's the problem with iTunes? Just figuring out what music she wants on there, how it gets on there, what gets on there, when it gets on there. Yeah. With this whole iCloud thing, with, with what's in the cloud, what's not in the cloud, what's on our device, what's on our computer. Because in, in a way with iTunes, you can have it in three different places. Is it just on the cloud? Is it just in your iTunes on your computer? Or is it on all three of your devices, on the cloud, your computer, and your iPhone? I don't know. I, I'm that, just that's so what's tired confusing her. It's just, is, all right, where's this song actually at? Is it, is it on all of my stuff? Is it just in the cloud? Is it on the computer? Is it on the computer and the cloud and my iPhone? Well, I, that's the biggest problem. I, and, and by the way, where, where are your pictures? Yeah. Where, where do your pictures go? 
And, and the other thing that, that's kind of confusing is the fact that they have split iTunes up into different applications where you have iTunes itself, you have the App Store, you have music, you have videos. They're all separate applications. But on your computer, it's just iTunes. Hmm. So her translating the fact that all that stuff on her computer is just iTunes, but then on her phone, she has to go to the music app for the music. She has to go to the videos for videos. But for looking at applications, it's just the app store. But if she wants music uh, from iTunes, it's in iTunes. Yeah. Well, I, you know what? I'm on a Mac, so I, I'm stuck using iTunes regardless, and I and I don't mind it. I know a lot of people hate it, but I, I really don't mind it. Yeah. Um, Personally, I don't care about iTunes. Yeah. You were a T-Mobile customer for a long time, and I discussed the jump, uh, I guess, plan that they added with Michael on T4 Show. I want to get your opinion on this because you, you, you've been kind of following the T-Mobile stuff and the contract-free stuff. I think it's a big gimmick. I'm not crazy about it, but you tell me what you think. This is something that's very interesting, and, and I don't think we've fully realized exactly what's going on here. Um, CNET had a fact, but now, for whatever reason, they've taken it down, so now I can't go back and look at their breakdown of it. Because, it, in a way, you, you almost need a breakdown step-by-step step of what all this stuff means. Um, from what I've been able to ascertain is that for $10 a month, uh, in addition to whatever you're paying T-Mobile for your device... Even if you if you're paying it monthly or if you're just buying it outright, it's it's ten dollars a month, and every six months you get to upgrade your device. So you'll have to be in this program for at least six months before you can do your first upgrade. And then from there, you would have to wait another six months. All right, no, 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 that's incorrect because you you could upgrade uh, after the first six months, and then you could upgrade a second time anytime you want after that. So if you wanted to two months after that upgrade to another device, well, then you've used both of your upgrades for that entire year. You'd have to wait until another year passes before you could do another upgrade. But it's $10 a month, $120 a year in order to be able to do that. It, it, in reality, it does sound like a very good deal. I think the catch is the fact of what is T-Mobile really getting in the end of this. And, and I don't think anybody really knows what T-Mobile is getting in the end here. Is it just that... The, they're able to do this somehow or yeah but i mean if you're paying them 120 bucks a year um and the phone is let's say well you're saving about 150 it, it doesn't it, it doesn't necessarily make sense because you what it is is that you get the the subsidized price i think it is and you just give them the the old phone back but how are they doing but, that for ten dollars a month? But you're also paying people are saying you're also paying that twenty dollars extra to get a subsidized price on a phone yeah. Right. If, if if let's say I got an iPhone and I'm not going to pay the six something out of pocket for it, I have to. And you know what? This is the problem with T-Mobile is that they come up with these crazy ideas that sound great when when you just say the concept of them, but once you start breaking it down, they're extremely confusing as far as what it is that they're actually doing. Whether it's no contract, um, the fact that they have this whole thing that's no contract, you don't have to have any contract, but. You either have to buy the phone outright or you have to pay a monthly um, fee in order to pay for the phone. Well, this is how so I see it. So in a way, okay. it's very confusing. They, they, they promise you one thing, but when you look at the details, there's something completely different. This is how I see it. You're actually paying $30 more a month. Okay. Because you have to pay the $20. Let's say I get an iPhone. I'm paying yeah. one ninety nine or what whatever one forty nine to get the subsidized price, and they're putting twenty dollars a month on my bill. On top of that, now I'm going to sign up for that jump program, which is another ten dollars a month. So I'm actually paying three hundred dollars a month to get a subsidized phone, three hundred dollars a year to get a subsidized phone, and to be able to kind of give it in at any time, and they take the phone away from me. Yeah. I, I I don't know. I don't get it. I don't think they're that cheap. I, I think at the end, you're ending up spending more money. T-Mobile is just one of those weird carriers where they're just trying everything to, to, to break through what every other character. And in a way, that's what they need to do because you have Verizon and AT&T doing the same thing. They're, they're, they're step in step 
where Sprint and T-Mobile are trying to break away from the pack and do something completely different to break yeah. customers off of Verizon and AT&T. It, it, what it amounts to is the fact that Verizon and AT&T have such a stronghold on customers that what the heck do you do to to incentivize customers to leave Verizon and AT&T and come over to just T-Mobile or Sprint? Um, I, think, I think it's a financial thing. I think a lot of people think it's much cheaper to go to T-Mobile and that's why they're on T-Mobile. I don't think anybody willingly is on T-Mobile. No. I, I highly doubt that people are saying, wow, I'm on T-Mobile because they're the best. T-Mobile is one I of the worst ones here in New York. I think most people go there because it's cheap. That's why yeah. I was on it. Yeah, it was but, cheap for me compared to Verizon. Okay, so how much cheaper is it? If I were to get it, I mean, reality, it, it, 4G. It, it, it was... What when I was looking into switching to the iPhone five, it was going to be twenty thirty dollars cheaper to be on T Mobile. Why? Why is it that? Like, what were you missing though? Um, I really wasn't missing anything. It, it, it was just a smaller network, basically, and they they didn't have their LTE hooked up at the time. Okay, so now they have LTE. Is it still cheaper? I think it's still. You know, see, this it depends on what plans you compare to. If you compare individual to individual, it, it's probably still cheaper. But I'm also now on a family plan with my parents because I help them pay stuff. So it, it ends up being about the same or cheaper on Verizon. Yeah, so it's it's close regardless. It's a, it's a close deal. Because in a way, share, sharing a, a data plan makes it cheaper. But if you're not sharing a data plan, it's more expensive. Yeah. Ugh. I don't know. I hate I hate the cell phone stuff. It's such a giant. I mean, speaking scam. of Sprint, they also announced that they have their own uh, unlimited plan. They've they've renamed their own plan, unlimited plan now. They call it My Way and All In Plans, um, which is really interesting. I don't know if you've read this story or not, but I, I'm trying to understand what they're doing here as well. What's well, eighty almost, bucks a month unlimited, right? That's what they're saying, but I don't understand what what's different about that from the previous eighty dollar. A month unlimited plan that they had. Am I uh, wrong in thinking that they they already had an eighty dollar unlimited month plan? I could have swore to you they did. So what's different other than the fact that it's a different name? Uh, let's see. The my all in plan also on the deck has arrived for arrival tomorrow, which was yesterday, I guess. Uh, which will run one hundred and ten dollars and adds five gigs of mobile hotspot usage. To the unlimited plan. So it's about the same thing. I just think this is all very interesting. The fact that we've almost in a way come full circle now. Where uh, for Sprint and other carriers. There was this whole thing where we had unlimited data. But it was costing too much. So they changed their plans to tiered plans. But now we're, we're shifting back to unlimited plans. Uh, you could pick, I, I think you could also combine different phones on the plan. Uh, you're getting, okay. So according to, according to their charts, okay, it's unlimited data. It's not capped unlimited talk, unlimited text and, uh, for $80. And then you got the two line plan, which is $150. So you could add two lines and then you could add single line, single line basic for 130 so pretty much so you're saying everything is unlimited, everything. Yeah, but they could also change the 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 price on these anytime they want. Sure. So yeah, they're saying it's true. Uh, uh, basically, all they're saying is the fact that we're gonna we're gonna have the option for unlimited data for life, no matter what. We're we're always gonna have some sort of unlimited option for customers. The only thing that could change is the price of what it costs to get unlimited. Yeah, I think that's all this amounts to is the fact that. We're going to rename this and tell you that you can have a limited forever. It's just it's a promise. A, I, don't, I don't like any of it. I'm I'm over all of it. <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk about I want to talk about the Kindle Fire because I thought this was cool. Uh, Boy Genius Report is claiming that they're they're also citing a trusted source that the first tablet uh, that the Kindle Fire is going to be releasing new new tablets and the first tablet would be a newer version of the seven inch Kindle Fire. The screen size and tablet would remain exactly the same. As existing models, but the resolution would be upped from uh, 1024 by 600 to 1280 by 800. 
So you're getting a, an HD display, I guess. Uh, the seven inch Kindle Fire HD would jump from 1920 by 1200. Uh, it would jump to 12, 1920 by 1200. And Boy Genius Reports is also claiming that uh, the 8.9 inch model would be offering a 2560 by 1600 resolution. That's a very high res display. Mm hmm. Uh, the new tablets would go through some small design changes, such as uh, repositioning of the power and volume button, and they're also going to be making them lighter. Does this make it exciting for you? Because I know a lot of people are fans of the Kindle Fire. Nope. You have no Not interest in the Kindle Fire. You know, I'll, t no, I'll tell you, you know something. As, as far as the tablets go, obviously the, the iPad is the king, but Kindle comes in close. Yeah. I mean, out of it all, does. Android has totally dropped the ball with the tablets. We have. Uh, if you're yeah. looking for an Android tablet, Kindle Fire is a good tablet. And if you're looking for the cheapest tablet out there, the Kindle Fire is a good cheap tablet. But in my opinion, go ahead, spend the money and get an iPad Mini. Sure. If that's what, what you really want. No. And if I, you want a larger version, just get an iPad. I don't know why somebody would go and buy like a Samsung tablet compared to getting an iPad. You're not even going to get any support for it. On Samsung. I'm just curious why people go and do that. Like, why are you buying that tablet when you could get either the Kindle? You could even get the Google tablet. But you're not getting and, support and, on that either. No, and the other thing to go, that goes against Android tablets is the fact that, okay, well, when do you get an update for the OS? Whenever we feel you like it. You won't. Well, whenever we feel like it. Uh, and, and especially if it's the Kindle Fire, you're never going to see an update for that device. Ever. Once you buy it, that's the operating system it comes with. You might get some security uh, updates, but that's the only thing you're going to get. It is what it you're is. You're not yeah. going to get a new entire OS on that thing ever, officially. It's just not going to happen. Kindle Fire that I have now, the first generation, they have never released another operating system for this whatsoever. I'm surprised they didn't release an update at all. I, I thought they would release well, some no, sort of for, software update. For two, three hundred dollars, you just go buy a new one. Yeah, that's what they want you to do. So it's my it's my father's bir birthday um, in in August. It's actually my five year anniversary, also. So he really wants an iPad, really wants an iPad. And I was, I had kind of assumed that you know the iPad would be announced in April or March, and a new iPad would come out. I get the new iPad, and I would give him mine. Now I don't know what to do. Do I give him my iPad and I get an iPad 4, you know, the new iPad, or do I get him a iPad mini? What would you do? Tell him to suck it up. See? Tell, tell, tell him that you're going to wait until a new iPad comes out. I mean, <laughs> when are we expecting a new iPad? I have no idea, but I'm guessing September. Yeah, I'm 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 hoping that it's going to be September, but I'm hoping that we September get September or October. Yeah, so I get the new iPad and I'll give him mine and he'll use it. But I I'm not even considering a Kindle Fire. Which is only a couple months after August, so. Yeah, but like I the, the point I'm trying to make is that I'm not even considering getting him a Kindle. I'm not even yeah. considering getting him an Android tablet. Like these are these are not options because I don't think it has the ease of use that the iPad has. Especially for someone that doesn't really do computing. You know, I, I, I almost wonder in a way that why are they doing this? Why are they now bringing up? When was the, the latest Kindle Fire update? When, when did they release the second generation? I want to say I want to say like like it was like September. OK, so so it's been less than a year. Yeah, I mean, so, so are they doing this just to in a, in a way because they found a new process a new production line that's going to be cheaper for them to manufacture in a way i almost feel like oh well we can if, if we change all this stuff we can actually have a cheaper manufacturing process and, and profit more money from it i don't know if that's true or not but that's just something that comes to mind hmm. why are they now doing this well, i think they're doing it because it's time to update and they, they might be getting someone that somebody else is updating also Huh. Uh, we'll do one more story and then we'll do our picks of the week. Uh, I, this was fascinating to me. This was reported about a week and a half ago, but uh, we didn't get a chance to talk about it. And 
Uh, we always talk about these media devices. We talk about Google TV. We talk about uh, Apple TV. Boxy has been acquired by Samsung at the price of $30 million. So Boxy, for people who don't remember, it was an open source What's Boxy. Pro- Boxy. <laughs> You don't remember Boxy? You remember Boxy? I remember yeah. Boxy, but it was an open source those... project. It was built on the Xbox Media Center platform. Uh, they the software was free for years. You could download the software, Mac or PC or Linux, and you could kind of create your own media device for your living room and connect everything to it. I actually thought it was pretty cool. I always liked Boxy because I I like the media, um, the Xbox Media Center interface. And uh, I used Boxy for a while, but they kind of fell apart. They put out that Boxy box a couple of years ago. Nobody really bought it. They put out some weird antenna adapter for it about a year ago. Nobody really bought it. And now we're getting news that they're being bought by Samsung. What does this mean for Boxy? And what does this mean for the technology? Will they? Will Samsung start using the Boxy technology in the TVs? Because I think that would be great if they're doing that. Good question, because I, I think this whole smart TV re- revolution thing needs a lot of work. Because it, I think the name smart TV makes you think, oh, it's smart. It's going to be something really cool, but it really isn't really all that smart. It's just a bunch of applications, and it's just they're trying to make it like a smartphone, but it's really not as cool as a smartphone. And it, this is the best thing that could happen to Boxy, quite honestly, because I think Boxy was standing on one of their last legs oh my but what were they going to do i mean obviously like exactly what What were they going to do you have roku out there that's just beating the pants off them um you have other services out there that's plex uh that you can get something similar to and then works on other devices and and the apple tv and boxy just was not able to compete in any way they just did not have the name for themselves they were trying to do something that I, I think was a little bit short sighted in what needed to be done. But what's so amazing is this is the is best that, thing. So why now if Box this is not you know who's gonna suffer from this if they start incorporating Boxy the Boxy interface on all these TVs, it's Google. Cause I honestly thought that every one of these Samsung TVs should have Google TV running it and within a year or two when, when yeah. the thing came out. That is not the case. I, I think that this is just gonna be they're gonna they're gonna cherry pick the technology they want from Bo- Boxy and shut it down and integrate it into a Samsung Smart TV. Yeah, it's it's not gonna be anything called Boxy. It might not even be anything that looks remotely like Boxy, but it'll have a couple of features here and there from Boxy that Samsung liked and wanted to incorporate into Samsung Smart TV. Yeah, but that's about all they're gonna do with it. I think. Ugh, so sad. So sad. it is, but that's that's basically what happens when you have a large company acquire a much smaller company. They they end up taking over their technology, integrating little bits here and there that they really wanted to incorporate into whatever product they wanted to do, and, and they throw the rest away. That's basically all there is to it. But uh, the core of Boxy is Xbox Media Center, XBMC. Yeah. Um. Which is still one of those niche things, and it's open source. It, it does it doesn't have mass appeal like Roku does. No, you you know you know the crazy part. I was running that on my original Xbox years ago. Yeah, and it was great. That was the first media center device that I've I ever had. This is way before the whole cloud thing happened. There were there were no services. It was just you know your your. Music port, but they were one of the only ones back then. They were yeah. one of the first. They were one of the pioneers. But now you have all these other ones that are, in my opinion, better than XBMC, better than Boxy. Yeah. Oh, that's sad. Plex is one of those. Roku Plex is, is good. one of those. No, Plex Apple is great. TV is one of those. Plex is really good. I really like Plex. Absolutely, they've got. See, one of the things that I hate about XBMC is just it looks awful. It's sluggish. But then you have Plex, which is just kind of like Web 2.0. Like going from Web to Web point, Web 2.0, that's the same thing of XBMC to Plex. Yeah. It's just such a major improvement over everything that we've seen before. Uh, all right, John. Uh, why don't we do our picks? Because I have a really good pick this week. All right, you want to go first then? Uh, I do. Uh, actually, you should go first. You should go first. Are you able to bring up websites yet? No, because a stupid uh, thing crashed. So no, there's oh, no that's websites. A bummer. Yeah. 
All right, so my pick of the week is a website called Feedly. And if anybody that's into RSS feed readers, you know, Google Reader shut down earlier this month at the beginning of the month. And a lot of people are still looking for alternatives. And Feedly is one of those uh, alternatives out there that's just mature enough for people to actually make the switch. Yes, there's like AOL Reader out there and Dig Reader and uh, I believe a couple other ones. But they just have not had a much time of building their product as Feedly has. Feedly has been around for a while. They've actually had iOS apps for many, many, many months now. So there's somebody that's not really new at the game. They just basically added a bunch of new features similar to Google Reader to what they already had. And it's really close to what Google Reader had. It's very close. So if you're looking for a Google Reader alternative, Feedly is where it's at right now. They just started this whole cloud thing where it syncs with the cloud. Everything's much more... Google Reader-ish, whereas before it might not have been. And, and so this is something that I've come to really use now as my Google Reader replacement. It's something that I feel is is on par or close enough to Google Reader to really use as my daily RSS feed reader. Um, it's completely free. All you have to do is go to Feedly.com, sign up. I believe you can sign in with your, your, your Google account and even automatically import whatever you had in uh, Google Reader. If not, I believe you can still export your data from Google Reader up until July 15th. At that point, that's their cutoff date for getting your data out of So Google do you Reader. feel so, that it's as good as Google Reader? It's close. I mean, it was very, very, very close. But was it also that you were just used to Google Reader? A lot of it was, yes. I've used um, a Grease Monkey script that adds a little things here and there. I mean, you can do the list view, which is is what I really love. If I have a lot of fees to get through, I don't want to see a bunch of images. I just want to scan headlines. And, and there's not a lot of other services out there that do that. Yes, there's, um, I forget the name of it, but there's other ones out there that just show you pages. It's more like a news paper rather than just showing you headlines, which is what and, I want. And, and how is Feely the dig, does a great job of that. How is the dig uh, reader? Dig? has a lot of potential, a lot of potential. I think their iOS app is nice, but they have a lot of bugs and features that they still need to work out and add. Okay. So at, at this point, I think Feedly is where it's at, and, and it's the same deal with AOL Reader. AOL Reader is just so new and so unpolished and undeveloped that uh, for somebody that's used to Google Reader, it, it's you're missing stuff, Yeah. and it just doesn't work as good as what you... Want. For somebody that's a hardcore uh, RSS fan, you have to have something that's just going to work. Even And I'm not saying that Feely doesn't have its little quirks here and there and doesn't necessarily measure up exactly to Google Reader, but it's good enough that I'm able to use it and, and I'm not going to necessarily hate using it or think every day that, oh, well, I wish this would have been better. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, my pick this week is for the Mac, and uh, I'll give you a little backstory on, on how I found this. So I, I listen to a lot of uh, live internet broadcasts, and something that plagues a lot of internet broadcasters is low volume. They th The volume on their live feeds are, are low if you're listening on a laptop or you're listening, you know, generally on a laptop, that's where I'm listening, and the audio is just really low. I don't know if you've ever experienced that, John. Yeah, I have. Uh, and I've always I've always said, like, well, you could tell them to raise the volume, but if it, if there's a problem on their end and they can't figure it out, that, that it's always going to be low. So I start, started looking for solutions on what I could do on my end to kind of boost the volume. I found this really cool app for the Mac. It's called Boom. Uh, it's in the Mac App Store. It's about $3.99. And what it does is it amplifies the audio. So you are actually able to... Take the volume. You could set it in the, I guess, in the in the preferences for the sound settings. You could turn boom on and then raise the volume to the point that you know it's actually listenable. Uh, obviously, don't go all the way because it's a good chance you might blow out the speakers on this thing. But uh, I use it almost every day now when I'm listening to certain shows, and it really helps, especially when like I'll put on a podcast and I'll turn the air conditioner on and I cannot hear anything because my air conditioner is so loud. With boom, that problem's not there because it's able to kind of break through the AC sound. It's in the Mac App Store. Uh, works really well. Really easy to use. Uh, it's called Boom. That's it. That's cool. Yeah, I, I've been looking I'm, for something. I'm a, like I cannot thing. stand when when you're on a website or watching something that has low volume. Oh, that happens really on YouTube it. all the time. Like I'll pull up a YouTube video and and it's I yeah. can't hear a thing. Yeah, 
I cannot stand it. And this fixes a lot of that. I mean, it, it's it's not going to be perfect, but it really helps out. Uh, and that's my pick of the week. All right, John. I like that. Any plugs? Uh, follow me on Twitter at Suncast. That's S U N K A S T. That's my Twitter. I do stupid stuff on there. I'll rant about stuff and why I hate Windows 8. <laughs> so if you want to hear me rant about Windows 8 and why I think it sucks, you can follow me. But otherwise, I'm sure you probably don't care what I tweet. And that's it. All right. You can follow me on Twitter <laughs> at Andrew Zarian. Of course, you can catch all our other shows here at the network. Free for all is on uh, at 8 p.m. tonight. And uh, we'll see you all next week, guys. Good night.